Coordination complexes involving the transition metals are commonly used in magnetic resonance imaging because they're magnetically responsive. They have magnetic properties. Gadolinium, for example, is one element that's used for this purpose. Coordination compounds containing gadolinium are introduced into the body, and then what we can do is apply a magnetic field to the body in a magnetic resonance imaging or MRI machine and observe where that gadolinium has gone. So it, it provides a means to image what's going on inside the body using MRI. Coordination compounds are also well known for their very bright colors, and these find applications as well, for example, in pigments. In this video, we're going to introduce a model of the electronic structure of coordination complexes that explains both the spectroscopic properties, the color, and the magnetic properties of coordination compounds. And the model is called crystal field theory. It's based on a fundamentally simple idea, but leads to very profound conclusions about the colors and magnetic properties of coordination complexes. So it's really a beautiful model that can be taught at an introductory level and learned at an introductory level fairly easily, but has far-reaching implications, high predictive power. This slide shows you how the color of a coordination compound depends on the identity of the metal as well as the ligands. So for example, Hexa aqua nickel 2, which is here on the left, is a nice green color right here. If you replace the water ligands with ethylene diamine ligands, you get this complex, which is a nice looking purple. And if you trade out the nickel 2 cation for the cobalt 3 cation, you get this cobalt complex, which is an orange color. So clearly here, color depends on the identity of the metal and the ligands. And there actually is a method to this madness to some degree. Crystal field theory is going to enable us to explain why these colors differ. So what's the deal with crystal field theory anyway? Well, the basic idea here is that we want to describe the nature and structure of electrons in transition metal complexes, coordination complexes containing transition metal cations or even neutral atoms at their center. And in particular, crystal field theory is based on the idea that when you bring in negatively charged ligands or ligands with negative electrons pointed toward the metal center, those negatively charged electrons are going to perturb or disturb the energies of the d electrons inside the metal atom or ion. And, and in particular, it's based on this idea that like charges repel. So when the electrons in the metal's d orbitals are near the electrons in the ligand orbital being donated to the metal to create the coordinate covalent bond, there's repulsion there and destabilization there. And we can think of, about this happening in two different ways depending on the nature of the ligand. We can think about the metal-ligand interaction as a kind of ion-dipole interaction where the metal is a cation and the ligand is neutral but has a dipole with the negative end pointed toward the positively charged metal, or as ion-ion interactions, essentially ionic bonds, when the ligand is anionic. So here, I've changed the neutral L to an anionic X-type ligand, and this may be a halogen or some other anionic atom like oxygen or nitrogen or even carbon. And the idea here is we can think of this as an ionic interaction between M plus and X minus. Crystal field theory works for both cases because it is essentially based on this idea that electrons repel each other. So we're thinking about the ligand as a source of negative charge via the lone pair that's being donated to the metal center in both of these cases. To introduce crystal field theory, we're going to focus on the octahedral geometry. And I ran out of green balls here, but we're going to consider a complex like this with the yellow metal center at the middle and ligands in an octahedral arrangement around the outside. Here our ligands are white and green. And actually one important point for crystal field theory from the outset is that the identity of the ligands doesn't really matter. We're going to treat each point in this octahedral arrangement as just a point source of negative charge. And all the negative charges have the same magnitude. They're all at the same distance so that the complex is at least abstractly perfectly symmetric. This is going to simplify our conclusions and lead to some simple yet powerful ideas about the nature of the d electrons at the metal center inside an octahedral coordination complex. And to begin thinking about this, what we can start to think about now is how the d orbitals at the metal center line up with the locations of the ligands. 
So what we're going to do here is consider again a point negative charge at each octahedral position in this coordination complex and recognize that d orbitals that point toward these locations are going to be especially destabilized by electron-electron repulsion. So notice here first and foremost that we have the ligands located at the octahedral positions here in particular for the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals. These are the orbitals that point directly in the directions of the axial ligands, for example, and the equatorial ligands, if you like, directly along these Cartesian directions. Those orbitals are pointed directly at the negatively charged ligands. So the electrons, which are negatively charged in those d orbitals, are severely destabilized via electron electron repulsion. Notice, for example, that in the dz squared, we've got this lobe pointed directly at the ligand L and this lobe pointed directly at a ligand L. In the dx squared minus y squared, we've got a similar thing going on in the x and y directions with one lobe of that d orbital directly pointed at a ligand. That's going to be a severely destabilizing effect in many cases. This does depend on the identity of the ligands to some degree, and we'll come to that later, but this basic idea that the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals will be relatively destabilized is going to hold regardless of the identity of the ligands. If we turn our attention to the remaining three d orbitals, we'll see that the lobes are actually in between where the ligands are located. So the dyz, for example, is sort of offset. We can see this lobe sort of pointed out towards us a little bit, right? Not aligned with the x or y or z directions. And this offset in all three of these orbitals means they are not quite so destabilized when those negatively charged ligands come in. What ends up happening here if we work through the math, which we won't do in detail, we'll just use the conclusion, is that these three orbitals are relatively low in energy and these two orbitals are relatively high in energy due to that pretty severe destabilization. The resulting orbital energy diagram for the d orbitals looks like this. Here are destabilized dz squared and dx squared minus y squared orbitals, and here are our three relatively not so badly destabilized d orbitals down here. And so we can think of the d orbitals, which are all degenerate, all of the same energy in the naked transition metal cation, splitting into two higher and three lower energy orbitals in the presence of what we would call an octahedral field, an octahedral arrangement of negative point charges. This creates an energy gap. The energy gap is known as delta oct. Delta refers to the crystal field splitting and oct to the octahedral geometry. And this delta has very important implications for the spectroscopic properties, the color, and the magnetic properties. Really quickly before we dig into delta in a little more detail, the orbitals split because of a difference in symmetry associated with the shape of the orbital. Orbitals that have what's called EG symmetry these are the ones that get relatively destabilized, the ones that are aligned along the octahedral directions. The orbitals that are offset have a symmetry called T2G, and as a result of that symmetry, they end up not as destabilized. So you'll hear the two higher energy orbitals referred to as EG or E sub G, and the three lower energy orbitals referred to as T2G. And notice, uh, you should note that this terminology only applies in an octahedral context. Now that we've seen how this scaffold of orbitals, d orbitals, comes about, the next step is to fill in the d orbitals with the number of d electrons. And this is where that d electron count that we've looked at previously becomes critical. If we know the number of d electrons in the transition metal cation based on its oxidation state, we know how many electrons to put in this orbital energy diagram. And one reason we care about putting electrons in this diagram is transitions of those electrons from a lower to a higher or a higher to a lower energy level are associated with the absorption or emission of light, respectively. Delta oct, the crystal field splitting, is just an energy difference between two sets of orbitals. So we can take an electron in a lower energy orbital, imagine that electron absorbing a photon of light and being promoted to a higher energy uh, level here, just as we would in an atom, for example, being excited with an electron being excited you know, from a 2s to a 2p orbital or, or something along those lines.
So photon absorption can cause an excitation from the T2G to the EG level. And of course, if we've got an excited state, that excited state can relax, can emit a photon, right, as an electron returns from the EG level to the T2G level. And we can do the usual photon wavelength and energy math to find the wavelength absorbed from a known crystal field splitting or vice versa, right? We can measure the absorption spectrum of a transition metal complex, for example, and get a sense of the value of delta oct in kilojoules per mole. And let me back up really quickly. This is just an energy, right? It's just an energy difference between two orbital energy levels. And so the units you'll see will be something like kilojoules per mole on the single molecule scale, something like electron volts may be used, but kilojoules per mole is very common for this value. Awesome. So now we've seen how the crystal field sp splitting is associated with the energy gap between orbitals, and that's associated with an absorption wavelength, a wavelength of light absorbed, the energy of that light corresponding to the energy gap between the E sub G and T sub 2G levels. Let's put this understanding into practice with this practice problem. So here we're looking at the octahedral complex, hexaquo titanium 3 with a single D electron, it's a D1 complex. And it's worth pausing and verifying this on your own if you're not sure why this is the case. We can excite this electron from the T2G to the EG level with visible light. And the maximum absorbance occurs at 499 nanometers. This is the wavelength of light at which the absorption is at a maximum, indicating that this corresponds to the energy gap between the T2G and EG levels. And what we want to know is delta oct in kilojoules per mole. The first thing to recognize here is that delta oct, this energy gap between these two sets of energy levels, is equal to the photon energy. And this equation evokes that at the top of the previous slide. So we can write the energy of the photon is equal to delta oct, and the energy of the photon is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by lambda. And from here, it's all just plug and chug and units. So H times C, Planck's constant times the speed of light, in electron volt nanometers is 1,240. And one electron volt is about 96.5 kilojoules per mole. So we start by taking that H times C value, dividing by our wavelength in nanometers. And then I'm just going to multiply by a conversion factor here to get the value of the energy from electron volts to kilojoules per mole. And the result is 240 kilojoules per mole. And this is right in that wheelhouse of visible light energies in the hundreds of kilojoules per mole. And it's typical of coordination complexes. This is one reason they're colored. They absorb in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum because these crystal field splitting energies are right there in that visible range.